Well, good afternoon and thank you for joining us today. My name is William Hild. I'm the Executive Director of Consumers Research, the nation's oldest consumer protection organization. I'm excited to be joined today for a panel where we're going to talk about some of the exciting developments in the world of consumer credit, specifically uh, some work that was done coming out of the Consumer Finance Protection Board. And uh, we're honored to be joined by uh, some of the people who worked on that uh, project today. Uh, I'm going to introduce them and then and hand it over to Brian Knight, our moderator uh, today, to get us started. Uh, starting off, we have Todd Zawicki, who's a George Mason University Foundation Professor of Law at George Mason University and a Senior Fellow at the Cato Institute's Center for Monetary and Financial Alternative. He served as the chairman for the CFPB's task force on federal consumer financial law, the subject of today's panel. Professor Zwicky is also one of the authors of Consumer Credit and the American Economy. Also with us today is Professor Tom Miller, uh, inaugural holder of the Jack R. Lee Chair in Financial Institutions and Consumer Finance at Mississippi State University and Senior Research Fellow here at Consumers Research. He currently serves as a member of the Academic Research Council at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Professor M Miller has several ongoing research projects on various topics in small dollar loans. He is the author of the Consumer Finance Primer, How Do Small Dollar Non-Bank Loans Work? And our moderator today is Brian Knight, Director of Innovation and Governance and a Senior Research Fellow at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. Brian's research focuses on numerous aspects of financial regulation, including the creation of pro-innovation regulatory environments, the role of federalism in fintech regulation, and the use of digital assets for financial transactions, the role of regulation for credit markets and consumer protection, and the provision of capital businesses. Well, with that, Brian, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Will. And I'd like to thank our panelists for joining us today, as well as for all of us, unintentionally coordinating our attire. So, you know, if anyone's wondering what the optimal webinar attire is, that question is now answered. Uh, anyway, <clears throat> so yeah, we're here to talk about, um, the thing that I guess brings us directly here is that this, the CFPB has released a, you know, released a significant report late, late last year, looking at consumer financial regulation and possible paths forward. We're honored to have two of the people involved in that with us today. <clears throat> and so first, I'd like to ask our very distinguished panelists, if they could maybe give a brief intro as to sort of what they see as the, the, the critical issues that the CFPB going forward is gonna to need to address and, and how they should address it. Todd, let's start with you. Thanks, Brian. And I wanna stress at the outset, um, although I was the chair of the CFPB Task Force on Federal Consumer Law, um, Financial Law, uh, it was a five member task force. I was honored to have sort of the dream team working with me, um, uh, several uh, uh, former heads of the uh, Federal Trade Commission, Bureau of Consumer Protection, um, and Bill McLeod and uh, Howard Beals, Tom Durkin, who's generally regarded as the leading consumer credit economist of the last several uh, decades, uh, and Gene Noonan, who has been working in this space for years and years and has um, unrivaled practical knowledge and in fact was the first um, uh, lawyer in the Federal Trade Commission uh, in the uh, Credit Practices Division. So um, this report reflects the, um, the uh, unanimous uh, views of everybody on the task force. Um, we're here today to talk primarily about um, the research um, and the role of research in constructing consumer financial protection policy. But in order to do that, we need to first think about where it fits within the uh, overall scheme, which is the CFPB is unusual in that it has five different regulatory tools, which is uh, really unique for what we know about consumer protection agencies around the world, um, which is they have regulation, enforcement, and supervision, which is well known, but they also have a very substantial policy research and development function, as well as a role in consumer education, which draws a lot on basically research as well to understand how consumers learn, how consumers use financial products uh, and, and the like. Um, and as we discuss in the report, one of the things that's important is to figure out how to use these five different tools together. Um, what is the optimal use at the margin for these different sorts of uh, sorts of tools? Um, and we can see this very dramatically with respect to research before we even get to any specific research questions. 
we see it as a more general point, which is that uh, um, that research uh, or what we call policy research and development has two very important things. First, it's important on the front end uh, to, to know what the problems are, uh, to know what we understand, um, and basically to, uh, um, to properly specify whatever the problem is that we're going to use the other regulatory tools to try to accomplish. Uh, so for example, um, properly specifying what is a consumer protection problem as opposed to some other problems, such as a problem of incentives. So for example, if a consumer um, responds to incentives, that may create problems to the consumer financial protection system, but it's not really a consumer protection problem. If, for example, a consumer defaults on a loan because they have an incentive to do so, that may be a problem. That may be something we're concerned about, but that may not be a consumer protection problem. And so that's important to craft policies because if we misspecify the problem, then we might end up actually creating a solution that is either not helpful or a solution that is actually counterproductive uh, in the sense that it could create problems like moral hazard and other potential problems for, uh, for consumers. Policy research and development is also um, important, what we could call ex post, which is after the fact. Uh, studying the uh, policies that are implemented, whether supervision, regulation, um, uh, education, uh, or enforcement, and determining whether or not the policy initiatives that have been taken will actually accomplish the goals that they were set out to accomplish, uh, which is to say understanding what the intended consequences and unintended consequences are of those policies and how they interact uh, well, with, the, with each other. Um, and in the report, we lay out basically three different um, overall views of, uh, of research that can be looked at in three ways. The first is to understand consumers, to understand consumer behavior, what consumers um, want to accomplish um, and whether or not they're accomplishing in practice um, welfare maximizing uh, goals. Second, we look at providers. Um, what uh, is the system of financial intermediation? What is the cost of providers and providing uh, 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 credit to consumers? What are the constraints? What are the risks? Um, all, those, uh, all those sorts of things. And then third, we look at it from an institutional perspective, uh, which is what, are, what is the proper role of regulatory agencies? Uh, where can they use their, um, where can regulatory agencies act, um, where can Congress act um, in order to improve consumer welfare in the first place? And second, what is the optimal mix of these five different um, policy tools that I described at the outset in terms of um, how to use them in collaboration in order to maximize uh, consumer welfare and the, uh, um, and the overall efficiency of the consumer financial uh, protection um, system. Um, we reported back, um, we did a two volume report. The first volume was about 800 pages, uh, which is sort of the background to a lot of this in, uh, in 12 chapters to cover a variety of topics, many of which we're gonna talk about today. And then the second volume consisted of 102 specific recommendations. Um, it would be interesting to know, uh, perhaps, that uh, when we categorized all the different recommendations in terms of uh, the various regulatory tools and the like, the single largest category of recommendations was with respect to research, uh, which was things that the CFPB or others should be doing in order to better understand um, these questions about consumer, uh, um, uh, consumer financial protection and consumer finance and how consumers use uh, payments, how consumers use credit uh, and, and the like. And so I'm thrilled today uh, that we're gonna have the opportunity to dig into some of these particular and specific issues uh, uh, that, were, that we discuss uh, in the report. Um, and I'm really grateful for, uh, for Will for putting this on, for Brian for hosting, and for Tom who wrote a, uh, a very interesting um, column uh, discussing some of this and the importance of our, our research. So I'm going to turn it over to Tom now. Thank you, Todd. And uh, thank you, Will and Brian and Bo for uh, organizing our session today. Um, at, at the outset, I am a, a, an active member of the Academic Research Council, the CFPB. So I uh, must say that anything I say uh, are my opinions alone. I was not on the task force because of my role in On the Arc, but I've been a uh, ardent supporter uh, 
of reigniting research in this important area, uh, building up in particular on the um, uh, work that was done in, uh, in the early uh, 70s uh, by the National Commission of Consumer Finance, uh, which was created by an act of Congress, actually. It was a, a long law, it had four, four parts. It was 22 pages long. And it created the Truth in Lending Act as one of the uh, parts and created this task force in the early 70s to investigate consumer credit markets. And um, so it's always been my desire that participants in this market, especially regulators and legislators, really understand how a mosaic of replicable research, meaning re research that we can replicate, and a mosaic meaning a whole series of papers and not just one paper alone or two papers alone, but research by its nature is a mosaic because you're looking at a specific problem at a certain time. These days, it just seems like we have this urgency to get things done. Um, the bully pulpit of the internet and uh, uh, instant TV and, and whatnot seems to drive a lot of uh, actions to get things done now. And then the question is, what are the right things to do? And uh, a lot of the consumer credit issues that we have today have existed for many years. And I would just like to, I, I'm a big fan of, of this report as well as the National Commission and Consumer Finance Report published in 72. Um, it talks about here's the history of consumer credit. Here's the theory. And in particular, I will say that this uh, task force was really uh, professionally uh, assembled and did work in a very professional manner. They have 150 years of combined experience in consumer credit. The first five chapters of this report are particularly really strong if you want to get a flavor for what our consumer credit markets all about? What are, how do the suppliers work? How do consumers work? How does the market operate? Um, Greg Ellahausen, and uh, who was uh, the chief economist on, on the task force, he and I and uh, a professor at Mississippi uh, College wrote a, uh, just wrote a recent paper uh, published in Economic Inquiry that is, serves as a jumping off springboard for small dollar credit markets. So if people want to get ramped up in that specifically, we look at much of the research and, and encapsulate that. So I'm just, uh, I'll finish by saying that I, the, um, I think quite uh, too seldom do we give the market its due. A co truly competitive consumer credit market really can solve many issues. Uh, of course, we need to have oversight to, to uh, throw out scoundrels but we don't want to raise up roadblocks in front of people on either side of the marketplace. And competition um, is really good consumer um, uh, credit uh, uh, enabler. So I'll leave it at that and turn it back to Brian. Thanks, Tom. So I guess let, let's sort of pull out the 30,000 feet here for a second and just kind of, get, kind of figure out where we're at. In, your, in the opinion of, 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 of both of you, do you think the CFPB or, or regulators in general have a good understanding of the role that research and empirics should play in the regulatory process? That's a great question, Brian. And I think, um, I think it's hard to generalize, uh, which is my sense is that different agencies have um, different cultures uh, with respect to this. Um, obviously, my experience of this is informed by the time I spent at the Federal Trade Commission, uh, where I was the director of the Office of Policy Planning. And one of the things that we did in that office was to help work with the Bureau of Economics and the other bureaus to figure out what, um, what we knew about a particular topic and what we needed to know. Uh, and basically anticipate what the new issues that were coming were going to be. Um, and, um, uh, um, and get out ahead of those so that you had a basic knowledge base uh, to be able to deal with problems um, as they arise or even determine whether things were particularly problems. 
Um, and what I learned during that time was there's a, there's a variety of ways in which research can be conducted by an agency. Uh, um, and the, the CFBB has started to make more use of some of these uh, over the past uh, couple of years. But for example, the FTC, in addition to doing sort of standard um, economics research, also does things like workshops and colloquiums. Um, and I've spoken at um, one of the uh, workshops that the, um, that the CFPB did. They did a number of them um, uh, when uh, Director Craniger was in charge, uh, one on um, uh, defining abusive practices, one on behavioral economics, um, they did uh, various uh, different topics which are, were designed to basically engage in this uh, policy research and development. So it's not something that the Bureau did a lot of. Uh, they did some, uh, some research in sort of a standard economic mode, but there's a variety of ways uh, that different agencies can do it. Um, but I do think that um, there is a problem with many agencies, which is that they just assume they know what the problem is and what the solution must be. Um, and this is something I think that sometimes in the past the CFPB has been prone to, uh, which is kind of putting the cart before the horse, which is to say, assuming that something is a problem and assuming they know what the problem is and assuming that the problem is in the nature of a consumer protection problem rather than really understanding what it is. And I think, uh, for example, one, one example of that would be the 2017 payday loan rule, uh, where the Bureau was trying to get at the question of why do um, consumers roll over um, payday loans or small dollar loans repeatedly. Um, and they just assumed that there must be something called a debt trap, uh, which meant that consumers were forced in some sense to roll over their, um, their loans. But as we point out in the report, um, you can't assume that. Uh, you, can't assu you can't assume that consumers are forced to roll over or consumers are irrational. Um, you, can, you, you have to act, basically ask the question, why do consumers uh, roll over loans? Is it, uh, um, what is the marginal incentive they have to roll over loans? How would an economist uh, think about this? And perhaps the CFPB has properly diagnosed that problem as a particular type of consumer protection problem, but they've never really established that fact, um, yet they proceeded along the lines of engaging in a regulation without really understanding necessarily what the problem was that they were trying to regulate. Thanks, Doug. Tom, how about you? You know, what do you think about, you know, the, are, are, is the CFPB in particular or regulators more generally, are they properly appreciating and using research? Well, as, as Todd said, that is a, uh, that is a, uh, a, an important question and a loaded question too. Um, in that I think that, uh, the, CFPB research staff has, has a, a, a group of capable researchers and they'll need, uh, I think what was missing perhaps is a roadmap for what to do in the future. And I be truly believe that this task force report will help serve as a roadmap on how to move forward. Um, now I have not been uh, involved in any uh, other government agencies other than the CFPB through the Academic Research Council. But I, I, I would say that, you know, they just have a tremendous opportunity right now to use this roadmap. Seems like they can hire as many economists as they would need to hire to uh, engage in research and reach out to the academic research community, build bridges. Uh, and and they're, they're, they're doing that with, uh, as Todd said, the colloquiums that they have and their research seminar um, series in-house and their annual research uh, um, conference. I think they can just, they can turn up the heat and do much more. And for one thing, I think that uh, they could start to do is, is let us know what the data is that they're making decisions on. Give data to researchers and see if we can replicate those results. Um, the, 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 I think the researchers at, at any agency are caught between a rock and a hard place in some sense. We have this urgency to do something now. And so that's like the hare and the tortoise and the hare race. So we have to get something done. 
whereas research just plods along at a predictably slow pace because it has to be thorough, rigorous, has to pass muster among academics. So we're trying to build policies on research, but it takes years to generate that research before we can really have a solid policy. And the uh, consumer uh, credit markets in particular, I think we have lost a lot of uh, academic researchers over the years. If we were to go back uh, 50 years, we had many more uh, economists engaged in this. And it's my fervent hope that we can kick the ball forward and say, let's how to figure out ways to increase our, our, our production of truly valuable uh, research. And so that, that prompts a, a question that, that I've often kind of wondered about. And I think that this report gets at, at this to some degree. And that is like, what do we know, right? I mean, I, I can't tell you how many times I've been, I've, I've said, oh, there must be an answer to this. And then you go and you dig into it and you're like, well, no, there, there's no answer. Or the answer is 30 years old and things have happened or, or what? So like from, from your perspectives, where do we have kind of a good base of knowledge that, that regulators and policymakers can draw on? And where do we need to actually go and do the research and close those gaps? That's a great question, Brian. And I like the way you framed it, which is, um, it turns out the field of uh, consumer fin fin uh, finance um, uh, research is a, a century old now. It goes back really uh, and maybe even further, but I think most of us think about a book by uh, Seligman in the 1920s um, as being, uh, a, it was a two volume treatise on uh, installment sales. Uh, that was the first, I think, real uh, scientific treatment of, of this. And I like the way you frame the question, Brian, which is what is it that um, we, we know, what is it that's a well-established research that's still true what is um, old research that may or may not be true? And what are questions we really don't know the answer to? And I think one of the things that, um, as Tom noted, the first five um, chapters of this report is basically a history, um, uh, including to some extent an intellectual history of everything we know about how consumers use credit. Um, and this builds on a century's worth of uh, knowledge. It's been repeatedly verified. Um, uh, through empirical testing, um, the, 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 uh, the model is very well established, um, and it seems to predict very well what consumers do most of the time. Uh, we contrast that in the report, for example, with the newfangled ideas of behavioral economics. And behavioral economics um, basically ignores this century of history. Uh, behavioral economics basically uh, doesn't recognize that there is a what well, an economist would call null hypothesis of how consumers have been uh, understood to use credit um, for the past century, and simply pretends like they're writing on a blank slate. Um, and the behavioral economics um, is very gimmicky. It's very new. Um, it's very poorly specified as a matter of theory and poorly, very poorly uh, verified as a matter of empirics. Um, yet a lot of people want to base um, uh, uh, policy on uh, on behavioral economics. So so there are things we know. There are things that we know that are that are old. Um, and there are a lot of things that we simply don't know the answer to, uh, and really important things. Uh, so for example, we por uh, point out in the report one area um, that it really needs more research is what are the the questions involving um, fin uh, financial inclusion for rural populations. Uh, that uh, rural populations have not been studied very much. Financial inclusion issues involving urban populations have been a big point of interest, but rural populations much less. And, um, and rural populations are especially challenging now because of uh, various reasons. Uh, uh, I think primarily regulation, but other factors have led to the closing of a lot of uh, rural banks and a lot of rural financial institutions. And so the questions of of, uh, of rural um, financial inclusion are, are quite challenging. Um, there's a lot of issues that um, have not been studied in terms of looking at the unintended consequences of various regulations uh, that we could come back to, such as the Credit Card Act, um, where, there's, um, where there's a lot of research that suggests that things like the Credit Card Act, things like the Durban Amendment, have had really severe unintended consequences in addition to their intended consequences uh, and very few people, um, or policymakers at least, have tried to assess 
of what those uh, what those trade offs are. Uh, another area that we point out is um, the challenges of uh, of um, formerly incarcerated populations, uh, which is a, a a group that's hardly been studied at all um, in terms of uh, of this. Um, and so there are there's just a lot of uh, just a lot of different questions um, uh, uh, that uh, that we just don't know the answer to. Uh, but are very pressing and important policy questions. And in order to get those right, we really need to get the research right first. Great. Um, how about you? Where do you see us having knowledge and where do you see us having knowledge gaps? Yeah, oh, thank you. And, and, and you really had a, that's a great way you framed the question. And um, I studied under uh, P, uh, professors who studied under uh, Professor Milton Friedman, and the question they would always ask you when you're presenting research is, how do you know? And <laughs> that was always a very hard question because we only know to a certain degree of statistical significance any questions, but we do know that incentives matter. We do know that consumers and suppliers respond to uh, incentives. Um, and Speaking of the rural areas, I will I'll use the infrastructure word here, but we do have a series of land grant uh, institutions that are in, in the United States at, uh, and agricultural experiment stations around the country that could be sources of, of labor or uh, uh, teammates in helping to study uh, the finances of rural population. Um, we also know that price controls matter that is particularly interest rate uh, uh, caps. We know that interest rate caps create shortages. We know that they um, stifle gains from trade and they impose search costs on consumers looking for uh, to, to, to make a trade. So uh, those are some things that we, we, we know. Um, and there are many things we don't know. If we look back uh, at, to the end of uh, World War II, the consumer credit industry at the time or the consumer credit market was pretty simple. The lives of the consumer were real pretty straightforward compared to, to today's consumer. Where we had a fixed rate mortgage, 20% down. Um, you had a bank that you went to locally. Uh, that was pretty much it. I mean, but in the intervening time period, we've seen the growth of mutual funds and, and um, uh, all, all kinds of other financial institution products. We've seen the growth of computers and cell phones. And so things have gotten uh, much more, um, uh, you know, just more difficult to understand in some sense. And so that, to me, that tells us we need to slow down and make sure that what we research or what we act upon is in fact solidly based. And we, we don't know uh, the true drivers of student loan debt, for example. We don't know, um, uh, as, as Todd said, uh, the Credit Card Act has different uh, unintended consequences. And one of the things that the report, the task force report recommends is for the CFPB to go back periodically and review uh, the regulations that are in place and what are its effects. So let's uh, let's get specific for a second because you know with the with the new the anticipated new leadership at the CFPB odds are excellent that we will see I guess the third revisit of the small dollar lending rule in uh, you know the past ten years. What what do we know now that that wasn't known then about small dollar credit and and where are there still gaps that that seem, you know, that should ideally be closed before, you know, that, or would ideally be closed to allow regulators to have the best shot at, uh, you know, regulating in an informed manner. Tom, why don't you take this one first? Okay, Todd. Um, I was free writing on you there for a second. Uh, <laughs> you caught me red handed. Um, incentives matter. Incentives matter. That's right. Um, you know, I, one of the things that we still don't know is how people use payday loans and why they don't default at a more frequent rate. Because if uh, on a $350 payday loan, it might cost the firm $400 or $500 to, to get a, uh, an order to collect. That doesn't mean they're gonna get the money. And people do have this option to default 
and don't seem to use it as often as one would think, especially if they were under some dire debt trap. Uh, and people are intelligent. They do know the, the, the borrowers in that market know all about the um, costs and benefits of defaulting. So, uh, and, and we don't know if repeated borrowing is really some sort of a small dollar, or excuse me, a, a cash flow uh, problem for, for businesses. To, for working capital for a business, let's say. We just don't know. Um, we, we really don't know uh, how often uh, lenders lend at the maximum permissible rate and do borrowers borrow the most they possibly can. There's some uh, new work that's being done in that area, but not published yet. But it's there's there's still plenty of things that we, we don't know. And if the one, one of the things I think that was really difficult uh, under the first payday loan rule was the idea of the ability or trying to get the ability to repay rule. And any lender will tell you there's ability to repay and then there's willingness to repay. And so, and then if, if, if we're trying to buy a major product like a house, I think there's a lot more due diligence by a bank on the ability to repay this 30 years or 20 years worth of monthly cash flows and the taxes to, for this house versus a three or $400 payday loan. People are using those loans because they don't have money. Um, banks will loan you money if you have money in, in the bank. And the subprime borrowers will say, well, if I had money in the bank, I'd just take that instead of borrowing money from someone else. So, you know, I, I do uh, think that we need to take a hard look at, at what ability to repay requirements will be uh, instituted. And it seems like that could be a, a major thrust of, of in the future. I don't know, but it's per possible. Yeah, as I noted, this is uh, sort of a classic example of the situation in which um, uh, where, where they're enacting regulations uh, without really uh, knowing that they know what the problem is, uh, which is um, the Dodd-Frank Act prohibits the CFPB from um, imposing national usury interest rate ceilings, um, uh, we, uh, which is, what, uh, is how this is regulated in a lot of states. And what the CFPB has done instead was attack this problem of what they saw as rollovers or uh, um, what they basically, in, in argument by definition, they just call it a debt trap. Um, and since calling it a debt trap means it's bad, um, we obviously want to get rid of it. Uh, but, but Tom alluded to the problem, which is we have to ask the question, which is why do consumers use payday loans and why did they roll them over? And we kind of know why consumers use payday loans is because they initially take out the payday loan because it's the least bad option that they have at any given time, um, as opposed to bouncing a check, doing a late bill pay. Um, you know, uh, um, uh, if they bounce a check or can't make a payment, that may mean their kids get kicked out of daycare or uh, they can't buy groceries. Um, uh, um, uh, or they could use overdraft protection or a pawn shop or, uh, or, or something like that. Um, now, the problem, the CFPB says, is that there's this magic time at which um, people borrow too much. Um, and they just assume by calling it a debt trap that, uh, um, that consumers must be forced to revolve or roll over their debt. But what we, but, uh, and they just, and given that they, uh, they just assume that they know the answer, then they kind of fish around and they say, well, why, why consumers might do that? Well, maybe it's because there's credit reporting of uh, their debts. No, that's not the case because payday lens uh, loans are not reported uh, to credit bureaus. Uh, maybe there's efforts to collect uh, or that there's a uh, lawsuits, but as Tom noted, most lenders do not try to collect uh, the loss on lawsuits because it's too expensive relative to the size of the debt. Uh, and, uh, um, uh, and there's no money there uh, to collect. Or third, they say, well, maybe they use debt collectors. Um, and they use some anecdotal evidence about complaints to have to suggest that. None of that proves the hypothesis. And in particular, none of that demonstrates um, 
why consumers uh, roll over. Um, and it's especially puzzling because default rates on payday loans are high, uh, which means that if the logic here is, is consumers roll over because of their fear of defaulting, then you wouldn't expect so many people to default. Um, you especially wouldn't expect so many people to default before they even make their first payment or the first payment or two. A totally viable alternative hypothesis um, that, that, is, that we mentioned in the report um, is the idea that consumers roll over um, basically because this is their last option for credit. The primary consequence of failing to uh, pay a payday loan is that you lose access to um, payday loans from that lender in the future and sometimes uh, others. Um, and so you want to keep that lifeline uh, alive. Now, that is a very different calculus from a consumer, from a consumer basically being forced to roll over because they're afraid they're going to get, uh, uh, get sued. Um, as Tom notes, the whole idea of just positing that it's a problem uh, to reuse a, a product um, um, is not inherently a problem. Credit cards depend on the whole idea that you're gonna roll over your credit card debt uh, year by year. Or, or month to month. One could easily say, can you believe those banks that want to force people into 30 years of uh, 30 years of mortgage payments? How's that for a debt trap? Uh, you won't be able to be out of debt for 30 years if you want to say that, right? Um, and so the mere fact that they reuse a product isn't a problem. Um, and so there's just a lot of specification that needs to be done there and a lot of understanding what consumers are doing before you even get to this question of whether or not uh, consumer welfare is going to be improved by arbitrarily limiting the number of loans they can take, um, especially um, in light of the fact that um, uh, some research Tom and I have been working on suggests that one reason uh, consumers borrow more in some states is because their states limit the amount uh, of money they can borrow on any given loan. Um, and so they just have to borrow more often to meet their credit needs. So that's another factor the CFPB hasn't considered. So I think that's really a good example of a situation in which they've written, you know, a 990 page rulemaking in 2017 uh, without ever laying the basic fundamental um, knowledge uh, base that you would need to know to, to be able to specify the problem correctly. So Thanks. Let's move on to another. Oh, sorry, just, let me just add quickly, though. One of the recommendations that the task force recommends is that agencies write rules in very simple language. <laughs> so I thought that was particularly uh, interesting recommendation given the onslaught of, of uh, complicated rules issued, not just by the CFPB, but by other agencies. So I'm, I'm all for that. And again, remember the Consumer Credit Protection Act of 1968, which created the Truth in Lending Act and the National Commission of Consumer Credit, uh, Consumer Finance was only 22 pages long. So that's a good model. You're asking lawyers to use plain language, uh, you know. Yeah. Climbing up a hill there. Uh, anyway, let's talk about another area that, uh, that we hear a lot about and at least in the past, was kind of viewed as, as a great sort of midpoint that everyone could agree on and seems to have lost some of that status recently, and that's consumer education, right? I mean, you know, the, the, the report talks about consumer education and it talks about some limitations on its effectiveness. And so, you know, what do we know about just how effective, like where is consumer education potentially effective? Where is it perhaps not effective? What do we know about consumer education and what do we need to know about it going forward? Yeah, that's a great question, Brian. And this is something, as I said, um, uh, Doc Frank gives the CFP five tools, and one of those tools is consumer education and consumer literacy. And so the CFPB has the opportunity to be here to be basically best in class, right, to, to, to analyze this, to develop materials um, uh, and, and the like. And the country as a whole spends a lot of resources on consumer financial uh, education. Um, and it's not clear that we have much to show for that. Uh, my daughter last summer um, is a 10th grader. She uh, took um, a mandatory uh, consumer financial literacy class here in uh, Virginia. Um, and I asked her one day, what are you studying? And she said, well, today we studied the difference between a traditional IRA and a Roth IRA. 
um, she was 15 years old. Um, it's not clear that that information is going to be that helpful to her uh, when she's 15 years old, that she's going to retain that, uh, that, that information. Um, so we spend a lot of time in terms of the opportunity cost and the resources and, um, and everything else. It's also one of those things where there's widespread bipartisan support uh, for it, uh, for having consumers be more knowledgeable. And the other thing that became that became apparent to us while we we're working on this is um, now it's more important than ever. Uh, the world is changing so rapidly, and there's so many innovations and products, and so many challenges for consumers that having a strong um, foundation of consumer literacy, like any other type of, of education, that a that a consumer can adapt, they can basically build on that foundation of education. To, um, to assess uh, new products and opportunities as they arise is more important than ever. Um, but as I said, there's very little evidence that uh, uh, historically that the way we've taught financial education has been very helpful. Um, and um, um, and what, the, what the research does tend to suggest is that there are some things historically that have been more effective than others, uh, which is it might be easier to develop um, habits such as savings habits, uh, for example, um, or routine decision-making habits, then it is to try to teach a consumer to, um, to, to choose the optimal investment uh, vehicle, uh, uh, for example. Um, it also is important that consumers get information at the time they need it, such as um, information about mortgages when they're taking out a, a mortgage. The other thing that we've discovered is that knowledge, like any other knowledge, deteriorates rapidly over time. So just as none of us here remember what we learned in uh, our ninth grade biology class, probably within a week after walking out of biology class, there's no reason to think that my daughter is gonna remember the difference between a Roth and a traditional IRA for more than a week after she walks out of her uh, financial uh, uh, literacy class. So, um, and so trying to come up with ways of helping consumers um, reinforce and reuse that um, uh, is, uh, is a challenge. And so, so we, um, see we, we saw consumer financial literacy as, a, as, a, as an opportunity as a valuable tool to supplement these other five tools both in empowering consumers as well as helping consumers protect themselves from fraud uh, and mis mistreatment um, but uh, but at the same time we do, don't see it as a panacea um, and we don't see it as a substitute for robust enforcement uh, regulation supervision um, and the other uh, and the other tools uh, th that we have. Um, and we also don't see disclosure as a panacea. Um, consumers already have too many disclosures. A docket, a, a stack of mortgage documents like that that nobody reads is not helpful to anybody. And so we basically say that we should think about, not only how we do consumer financial education, but how we do disclosures um, uh, to consumers so that they actually get the uh, useful information, the relevant information, and not get buried in a, in a maze of, uh, of information where they just feel drowned, um, but allow consumers to focus on the terms and conditions that really matter to them, and then basically um, have the uh, uh, CFPB and other enforcement agencies protect them from uh, from um, from uh, unfair practices. So I would just like to piggyback a little bit on something that Todd brought up, um, uh, that getting in the habit of uh, uh, of investing early is an important thing. Now, if any of you guys can tell me the optimal investment vehicle from now and over the next 15 years, I'm all ears about that. But uh, clearly, uh, you know, that we don't know what that is. I tell my students uh, all the time to make sure that once they get a job to start saving, it doesn't matter what. And actually, it matters um, uh, what rate you get. So if you're more risk averse, and you don't put it, your wealth in, or your investments into re assets that could possibly gain more, you could lose out. And in, in a, in a classic textbook example is if you invest $400 a month for 40 years at the equity risk premium observed since 1926, which is around 10%, that is about $2.5 million. If you invested 8% instead, it's $1.3 um, $4 million, I think. So it costs you 
a million dollars, that 2%. So if we're trying to educate people on wealth creation, I think getting in the habit of savings pre-tax so you don't see the money. Now, a lot of us have money burns a hole in my pocket, so I have to save before before I get the cash. Uh, but that is, that I think to me, that is uh, something that, that um, the CFPB could, could push and others could, could push uh, to, to just to get in that habit. And actually the CFPB has a program. I, I'm, I apologize to them that I don't remember the name, but I thought it was a good program. And the idea behind it was to get in the habit of saving. And I think they're right on point with that. Yeah, let me amplify what Tom just said, which is um, one thing the CFPB has done that's very impressive is um, one of the reasons why f consumer financial literacy has not uh, succeeded in the past was because we are never quite sure how to measure success. What exactly were we trying to do? And I think one thing that the CFPB has done very usefully in the last few years is come up with a rubric for measuring success. Basically, they call it uh, financial well-being. Um, and um, it's sort of an overall confidence and security that people have in their in their finances. That is a, a useful definition um, and one that's better than how do you perform on an arbitrary five question, uh, you know, multiple choice uh, uh, test. And so I think that gets us a long way. But building on Tom's uh, a point. Um, uh, about about investments is obviously this country right now cares a lot about financial inclusion about the uh, about the wealth gap racial wealth gap uh, gen, you know gender wealth gap all these questions of equality and as Tom suggests um, uh, uh, people's um, your 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 how much wealth you end up with um, depends in part on how you invest what you actually have um, and what the research does tend to suggest is that people who feel like they have more financial um, understanding for, um, are more willing to invest in um, the stock market, for example, uh, are more willing to take on higher risk and therefore get higher return uh, over time. So understanding um, different people's risk tolerances, understanding whether there are patterns uh, among different races or genders or, or whatever, in terms of, of people's willingness to, um, to take on risk um, and how that ends up being reflected in um, the investments they make and uh, the wealth they accumulate, um, I think could be a very powerful vehicle for, um, for dealing with these questions of uh, equal, uh, inequality uh, that, um, that a lot of people are wrestling with right now. And it's not a question we've really focused on um, of you know, sort of using that lever uh, is a mechanism for attacking um, in, uh, wealth inequality. So I want to pick up on something, Todd, that, that you mentioned with regards to disclosure, because I mean that, that's the other, you know, that's the other big thing that everyone kind of agrees, agreed on that like, well, we could just do more of that and it will work out. And that consensus has broken down um, kind of from all directions. And I was wondering, you know, from, from your perspectives, what, you know, like, what do we know about disclosure and like how, when does it work and when does it not work? And given this, the fact that things have changed significantly since you had things like TILA passed, right? right. Where are the areas where, where there, there's potential gains to be had for modernizing our disclosure? Yeah, uh, you know, that I think disclosures kind of came about, and Tom notes this interesting, um, this interesting uh, uh, um, parallel or, or, or irony that that the National Commission on Consumer Finance was part of the same bill that uh, created the Truth in Lending Act, um, and um, there are sort of five ideas that run through the task force report, which actually uh, match the same basic ideas we saw in the National Commission on Consumer Finance report, which is competition, innovation, inclusion, disclosure, and modernization. Um, and everybody understands that disclosure can be a very powerful tool in terms of promoting competition, um, enabling consumers to make better choices, consumers protecting themselves against fraud uh, uh, and the like. 
but it's also possible to have too much of a good thing. And that seems to be where we are at with disclosures right now, which is every time there's a problem, they say, let's add another disclosure, but they never say, well, what disclosure are we going to take away so that we don't um, overwhelm consumers with, uh, with this information? Good example is um, a study that was done that we cite about um, the, what consumers say about the information they receive when they open a bank account. Only about half of consumers say that they feel like they received the right amount of information when they open a bank account. Among those who, the other half, half of those say they, were, <clears throat> they received too little information and the other half say they received too much information. Uh, the problem is, is you just tile one disclosure on top of another. So what we basically argue for is that, the, that we should specify exactly what we're trying to accomplish with our disclosures. And for most disclosures, what that means is helping consumers shop, helping consumers find the products they want at the lowest price. Um, and a lot of the other purposes of disclosure can be sort of set aside or they can be things that can put in a file that consumers can refer to, uh, to later. Obviously, the second thing, and you alluded to this, Brian, is consumers, um, financial consumers, use information um, and process information differently than they did back in the Ralph Nader period, uh, which is to say people want things on their phone. People want just-in-time disclosures. People want e-disclosures. Um, and that's an area um, that uh, um, is turning out to be uh, very challenging. Um, to, uh, and uh, um, and there, there has to be a way of modernizing disclosures in such a fashion so that consumers who want things on their, their phone uh, can get it. A good example is um, e-sign. Um, and the difficult e-sign was a, a law that was pretty much obsolete at the moment it was written. It was supposed to, you know, uh, uh, but it's really hard to modernize now because basically there are entrenched interests around, including consumer groups uh, that, you know, uh, um, uh, are, they just for whatever reason insist on these very arcane and archaic uh, uh, disclosure rules um, that don't uh, allow us to get to the level where uh, most consumers want to be, which is uh, e-disclosure. Um, and so understanding how consumers use disclosure today and how we can deliver it in a more user-friendly um, 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 uh, fashion is one of is a key research question that we hope the CFPB will continue to look at. And I would just like to just say one quick thing about disclosures and that there is such a thing as rational ignorance. Uh, Marcus Cole talks about that. And the idea is that if Brian reads the disclosures, why should I? I'll just free ride on the people who actually do read the disclosures and rely on the, the rule writers to uh, create appropriate disclosures. So uh, if you ask me, do I read any of the disclosures on downloading software? I say, I haven't done that since 1980. So, um, and I'm probably, you know, going to get a big surprise one day when uh, <laughs> uh, Windows owns owns me. But anyway. Um, yeah, but think about these these pop up messages you get every time you go to a website. Yeah. I mean, that is um, that is that is pretend consumer protection. Yeah. Nobody's reading those things. You get the pop up about cookies. You click the box um, <laughs> to say that that resembles consumer protection is sort of an abuse of the English language. Um, what you want to do is regulate um, unfair terms and conditions, and then yeah. focus, you know, and then focus consumers on what actually matters, um, whatever that might be uh, in those particular circumstances. But that's a good example of where disclosure, in many ways, is a barrier to effective consumer protection rather than a um, um, an effective tool for it. I agree. So we're starting. We're starting to get near the end of our time, and before we hit the end, I want to make sure we have time to discuss the more, the less glamorous but frequently more important side of things, which is procedure. And <laughs> you know, what if, if you were advising the the, the incoming director of, of the CFPB? What 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 procedural changes, if any, do you, do you think, or you know, structural changes, if any, would be appropriate to allow the CFPB to better utilize research? as it performs all five of its functions, five of its tools, I should say. Tom, why don't you take that? Yeah, okay. And 
I had I had uh, alluded to it. I want to circle back around. I, uh, procedurally, I, I I just think uh, increasing the size of the uh, researchers and their mission, um, hire people who really want to study consumer credit issues and uh, work with uh, people in academia, uh, partnerships, uh, and spread the word and. Um, you know, if I could wave a magic wand, I'd say, let's start a brand new academic journal, call it the, uh, the Journal of Consumer Credit. And it, the CFPB could fund that and it would be an academic outlet and, and people would respond to that incentive of having an academic outlet. So um, I, I just would say being more transparent in the data uh, uh, to the academic community and, and, and to consumers. It's like, what did you, why, how did you come to this result, this conclusion when you have a, a new regulation? I guess, is that a procedure, Brian? Sure. Why not? Okay. <laughs> yeah. I would like to, to emphasize the point Tom makes about, um, data accessibility. Uh, this is a point that, um, Michael Flores and I made many uh, several years ago now uh, with respect to um, uh, analyzing work that the uh, CFPB did on um, overdraft protection. Um, Jason Johnston and I uh, made this point when we were reviewing the CFPB's uh, arbitration study um, that that uh, um, uh, that that selectively reporting data um, is bad in and of itself. But I would especially it call on the uh, the, the new uh, uh, the directors uh, um, to consider the fact that the CFPB since its inception has been a real political football. Um, it's been uh, um, it's been very controversial. It's been very politicized. Um, uh, Director Craninger, um, her overarching goal seems to have been to to reduce uh, some of that. And I would suggest that um, taking some of the steps that Tom says, including a, a more transparency in the data that is used for regulation for studies and that sort of thing would go a long way towards building confidence uh, that the Bureau is um, nonpartisan, that the Bureau is uh, not acting in a political uh, uh, fashion and kind of showing its homework um, and allowing it to be, um, to be, to be checked, I think um, could probably go a long way towards building legitimacy of the Bureau. In, in other agencies, such as the Federal Trade Commission, which is we all know as a bipartisan agency, the minority commissioners serve that role. The minority commissioners will be the ones who will be able to point out flaws in the analysis that uh, a rule lies, a rule lies on or an enforcement action or whatever, or to you know solicit their own uh, um, uh, information and the like. But at the CFPB, where you have this single director um, uh, um, structure, you don't have that kind of internal check. And so I would suggest that might be a useful way of, um, of uh, building some, uh, some confidence in what's coming out of the agency would be some, take some of these steps with regard to transparency that Tom describes. So we have just a couple of minutes left. So I'd like you know, to go to each of our panelists just to have any closing thoughts, anything, anything they feel like they, I should have, I should have asked that I failed to, or anything like that. What, what, what are your closing thoughts on this topic? What, wither, wither uh, consumer research, well, not the organization, but the. the yeah, topic. As, as I said, we lay out a pretty ambitious plan for research uh -huh. uh, in in the report, um, and that speaks a lot to the fact that um, that by and large, uh, consumer uh, uh, consumer finance has not been a vibrant area of. Um, economics research in universities for several decades, other than uh, Tom and, and, and a few others. I mean, to the extent that it's had a resurgence in recent years, it's unfortunate that it's had a resurgence as essentially uh, considered a sort of um, subsidiary of behavioral economics. It's basically a tool for testing behavioral economics rather than um, as Gerd Gigerenzer uh, uh, has suggested in his article, The Bias Bias, rather than focusing on how consumers make decisions um, um, and what rubrics they use to, to do it, it's been seen as a field of applied behavioral economics. And so you get a, uh, a very strange set of uh, questions and a very strange uh, um, set, of, uh, set of answers. And so there's a real need uh, for, for good research. Um, there are huge emerging areas. Uh, um, the, the world is accelerating at an accelerating rate. Uh, 
uh, and consumers are being um, buffeted by increasing amounts of information, increasing access uh, to information. Um, one of the points we, we mention in the report is that um, government mandated disclosures are not the only way that in, uh, consumers get information about products, uh, for example. You've got all these websites now, you know, CardHub or CreditCards.com or these various things that, that uh, will, will, you know, help you find uh, products, get reviews of products, uh, providers uh, uh, in the uh, in the like, um, I'm sure. I mean, the the re, you know that there are you know Wells Fargo, for example. There's ample evidence now that people think twice before they open a new bank account at Wells Fargo, um, uh, in light of some of the uh, you know the issues uh, that they had. And so, um, and so consumers get information from a lot of different places other than just government mandated disclosures. Let's understand. Uh, what the, what that is. Um, and then there's a lot of other areas such as student loans, which Tom alluded to at the beginning, which is we actually know very little about student loans, um, um, what causes default on student loans, yet we're going to create a, a uh, we're talking about creating a massive taxpayer bailout of uh, student loan borrowers without really having a good handle on the uh, on the nature of the, uh, of the of the problem. And so that's a good example of something where we might want to pause for a moment. Think about what the problem is, and as we discuss in the report, we talk about some of the possible unintended consequences of some of the solutions that have been put on the uh, on the table. Maybe we want to um, study those potential unintended consequences also before we uh, dive forward uh, um, on this uh, bold project. So there's you know there's a lot of there's still a lot of unanswered questions. This is an area that touches every single American um, uh, in their at their proverbial kitchen table. Um, and so getting these questions right um, is as important as just about anything we could do um, in terms of impacting the American economy and the everyday lives of American families. Well, I would just say, I know we're over time right now, but I would like just uh, uh, 10 seconds to say, I really hope that this is just the beginning of a conversation that we keep building on. The momentum starts to build on spreading uh, the notion of increased consumer research, objective research, rigorous, replicable, et cetera, I think is, 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 is an important thing. So I want to say thanks to Todd and Will and Brian and Bo. Uh, it's been a terrific um, uh, webcast. Exactly. Thank you, Consumers Research, for, uh, for shining a light on this important issue. And thank you, Brian, for, your, uh, for, for hosting us. Thank you both, and I'll, I'll thank you. Turn it over to Will with my thanks for having me and for hosting this. Thank you, Tom, Brian, and Todd for joining us today. I appreciate, especially appreciated your comments there at the end, Tom uh, or Todd. Excuse me in in regards to uh, websites that provide consumer information. Uh, consumers Research, I should note, has just launched one. Uh, consumers Bulletin, which was our magazine going back starting in 1931, is now a digital publication and can be found at consumersbulletin.org. And it is uh, an aggregator of both uh, third-party uh, consumer news, much like you just noted, different information about credit offerings and product offerings, but also original research that staff members here at Consumers Research do as well. Um, there you can find not only uh, that reporting, but a recording of, of, of uh, this and past events, one of which we did do on uh, uh, student uh, loan financing. Again, uh, Todd, as you noted. Um, so we're uh, definitely, uh, uh, hopefully trying to fill some of those market gaps <laughs> that you, uh, you noted uh, need to be filled. I'd like to thank our audience uh, for joining us today. And with that, we are adjourned.